Tubers, Tibets, crazy people. Well, it's been quite the quite the week here on the Little Dog Channel, huh? <laughs> and uh, after a little bit of controversy, uh, wouldn't you know, my friend Ian, who is an Australian lawyer, uh, is in town this week, and him and I got together the other day, and we had the opportunity to sit down and talk at length about, you guessed it, con men, shysters, scammers, and a whole boatload of stuff. And Ian is an advocate for people that have been subjected to that kind of treatment. He has worked tirelessly um, uh, with some of the families of the victims of what's known as Death Island in Thailand. And he's very familiar with how con men, scammers, and the other sort of a group of nefarious type of people work. And so he granted me the opportunity to sit down the other day, chat with him, and see what he's got to say about the whole deal. So without further ado, here's my little interview with Ian. Well, my friend Ian, it has been a while since you and I have been together. Yes, it's been just over three years now, thanks to that uh, dreadful disease called COVID, but uh, I've made it back to Dumaguete at last, and uh, it's great to see you again, Paul. Great and, to have you here. And hello to all of the viewers, especially all the my friends in the United States. Yeah, and so last time you were here, we were hanging out, we went to Sikihor with some other couples. That's right. And uh, I think you came very graciously with a cake because Baby May, my now wife, yes. had 200 subscribers. Yes, yes, that was a while ago. <laughs> that was the older days. And then yesterday, you brought another cake. Another cake. For the 20,000 subscribers. Well, 21,000. 21. Yes. He yeah. knows more about her channel than I do. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people know a lot about Baby May's channel. She's, uh, she's a bit of a star. And you've got over 75,000 viewers now. I knew you when you had 4,000. Yeah, but none of them watch anymore, so you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Oh, well, we're grateful for whoever's watching today. Um, so bring us up to speed. What's new with you? What's been going on? A little bit of background about you. Yes. Uh, and I'll just give you the form here. Okay, well, if you haven't already worked out by my, uh, my fine accent, uh, I happen to come from Australia. Uh, we're friendly with the United States, by the way. And um, I'm a lawyer in Perth, Western Australia, and... Uh, I suppose for the last few years I've been very much focused on exposing a lot of uh, crime and murders on an island in Thailand called Koh Tao. That's K-O-H-T-A-O, the two words. Um, and uh, recently there's been an excellent podcast which has actually been created by some American investigative journalists who've done a much better job than many of uh, the British investigative journalists. They've done a fantastic job with this podcast and the podcast is called Death Island and uh, I've uh, helped them with some of their background material and they've also interviewed me so uh, my voice appears on the podcast which is available on iHeart. It's created by KT Studios or K for Kansas, T for Texas Studios or I think that your pronunciation would be Studios. Studio. studio. Yeah, studios. So KT Studios um, out of uh, Los Angeles. So um, uh, Los Angeles. Los Angeles, sorry. City of Angels. You know, you people from Austin, y'all talk funny. <laughs> <laughs> Bless his heart. <laughs> we can have some. So here we are with yet. another guy got information on Thailand. I'm 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 a hundred percent this week. Yep. And uh, when you told me you were going to talk about some of the scams and stuff yes, that scams. happened in Thailand, yep. I started to develop a twitch because <laughs> we've had an interesting week so far on the Old Dog channel. Yes. But uh, we keep soldiering on. Yeah. So what's your agenda here? I saw you wrote down notes and everything. Oh, actually, man, oh, yes. I That's unusual it. for this group. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was thinking that uh, we, would dis we, we had a, a good discussion yesterday about various types of scams. and uh, Fits thought, right in. <laughs> and uh, I thought the good theme would be something like don't get played, you know, don't get pl played for a fool. And quite often there are plenty of YouTubers and people around who warn about, oh, you might overpay for a taxi ride, 
as a foreigner or you might um, get scammed with, with gem scams in uh, Thailand or you might have something like you might hire a car and surrender your passport to hire a car or a jet ski and then uh, when you go to return the car or jet ski you'll be charged for damage that never occurred uh, right. and so in order to get your passport back you're really held to ransom and so uh, they're the sort of scams that are normally mentioned but there are much bigger scams that happen overseas and they're not necessarily all perpetrated by the local whether it's a Filipino or whether it's a Thai often the biggest perpetrators are other expats there are a lot of expats in Thailand and in the Philippines who've got criminal pasts and then they come uh, I had no idea no <laughs> well, they come to Southeast Asia and then they reinvent themselves Really? And, then, and they'll tell you that you know they had, had some fantastic position in another country, uh -huh. which is very difficult to verify. Uh -huh. And you've got to be very careful of taking a, a new person, a stranger, at their word. And we were talking about other things too, like stolen dollar. I mean, it's incredible how many people there are running around who will say that they're a former Navy SEAL or they're a former member of the British SAS. And probably for every one true Navy SEAL or one true SAS member, you might find that there are a thousand people claiming that they were part of these elite special forces. So there's a lot of scammers around. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, also, you know, obviously there are a lot of um, uh, financial scams uh, around the place in the USA and in Australia. And we were talking about um, people like Warren Buffett and uh, one of his um, one of his uh, many sort of pearls of wisdom is that often if you find a, a uh, cockroach somewhere, you have to remember that there's always more than one cockroach in the kitchen and over the next uh, few days you're going to meet all the relatives. So if you see one cockroach, you'll see a hundred or there will actually be a hundred or a thousand. And it's the same as with financial reporting, that if you see one ir irregularity, it's often a good sign that there are many others hitting, you know, hidden beneath the surface. Um, so, uh, you know, in that sort of uh, vein, you know, we sort of mentioned people the other day like Bernie Madoff. I mean, there were people for years and years and years telling the you know, financial readers that Bernie Madoff was a financial genius, but, you know, if something's too good to be true, it invariably is um, right. too good to be true. It's often false. And um, so Bernie Madoff was uh, notorious a few years ago when he was finally exposed. But there were people, there were people around who were warning investors that, you know, Bernie Madoff wasn't you know, possibly legit because, you know, he was always getting these very high, consistently high returns. Yeah. Rather than, you know, even if it's, you know, there were no dips. It was always on the up. Right. And so that was uh, the big red flag. And then there was um, Elizabeth Holmes, who was the young blonde girl who ran uh, the company Theranos, which... Uh, yeah, they claimed that from one drop of blood they could right, do, right, do, do right, dozens right. of tests. Anyway, her company Theranos was valued at about eight or nine billion US dollars, a fabulous amount of money, but then it uh, was exposed as being a um, complete sham, a complete fraud. So we get scams here in the Philippines, we get scams in Thailand and um, we get scams in Australia. And it's often you need to sort of be aware of things and just don't believe the first thing that you read. And certainly there are a lot of journalists, I mean, there were financial journalists talking about Elizabeth Holmes and Bernie Madoff. You know, they were put on the front cover of, uh, the front covers of many prestigious magazines, you know, Fortune type magazines. And, um, you know, it's Warren, Buffin, Warren Buffett himself would often be very scathing of the standard of uh, financial journalism. And so um, you've just got to be um, a bit wary and don't believe the first thing that a journalist might write or say um, keeping in mind, of course, that there's a huge variation in the standard of journalism and, in, and investigative journalism. Some are really hopeless and others are quite outstanding. And How do you tell the difference? It's not always easy, is it? No. <laughs> no, it seemed so easy back in the day. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, also, in hindsight. I used to watch stuff like 60 Minutes and yep. all that. Yep. And I've always, in fact, Australia has its version of 60 Minutes. We do. And I love it. Yep. I mean, it seems like it's pretty authentic. Yep. And they seem to back up what they're yep. talking about. I yep. find those shows still credible. Yes. Uh, I, hopefully I'm right about yes. that. Yep. But if I just turn on the nightly news, 
it's yep. usually an agenda being pushed. Yep. So, as a as a lawyer, barrister, is that what you're referring well, to? Well, in Australia, in Western Australia, I'm called a barrister and solicitor. Um, so, you know, I can appear in court. I have appeared in court, uh, but most of my work is actually done in my office. And in fact, a lot of my work involves uh, investigating fraud. Sometimes it's uh, fraud against deceased estates and sometimes it's fraud against investors. What is the most common fraud that you've seen? Well, it or that you've yeah. been involved with, I should, well, I should I suppose say. Well, I suppose the most common one that I've been involved with has uh, probably been fraud against deceased estates. Well, we've got a motorbike going past. That's okay. It's been fraud against deceased estates. Um, but, uh, you know, I've had some very big ones. When, when I say very big, you know, running into millions of dollars, not billions. But, uh, you know, I had uh, one very interesting case over 20 years ago where a, uh, a fellow from Wales, he was a very charming, that's often a red flag if someone's too charming, a, f a fellow uh, from Wales had uh, been promoting what's called a blue gum plantation scheme. A blue gum is a very large Australian tree and when it's harvested it's worth a lot of money. But uh, he was promoting this uh, blue gum plantation scheme uh, but he had not complied with Australian law because you're supposed to have what's called a prospectus which gives you background into what the company or the investment scheme is all about and he had been raising money with other people uh, without a prospectus in contravention of the, our corporation's law and uh, anyway he'd been caught out a couple of times and the Australian Securities Commission as it was then known it's now called the Australian Securities and Investments Commission they made him sign a, uh, an undertaking that a lawyer would hold a meeting of all of the investors who invested a lot of money in this scheme and had lost a lot of money uh, to see what they wanted to do moving forward because the trees were now actually worth something and there could be something salvaged from their investment. They were going to lose money but they could salvage something. And when I started looking into it, I found one fraud after another. There were frauds against our uh, federal revenue, there were frauds against the state revenue and there were certainly a lot of frauds against investors where units in this scheme were being traded but they were being traded. The, uh, the buyers were being told to pay $7,000 for something which actually had a negative value but they were paying $7,000 per unit but the sellers were receiving three and a half. And so this was being, that wasn't transparent. There was a double dip there. Yeah, they, they just kept yeah. half the money and they, they pocketed it. But um, I found out lots of other um, uh, nefarious things that were going on and I wrote a massive report on that. But you know, one of the interesting things about that is I was uh, briefing a, a full-time barrister about it and I mentioned to him at the very beginning that this guy from Wales, he doesn't seem very financially astute or astute and he um, I said he doesn't seem astute but he's very charming and they've lost a lot of money but as soon as I said that he was charming the barrister said oh he's a con man yeah. and so it was just a, a red flag and sometimes it's good to look out for red flags whether you're there in the US whether you're in England whether you're in Australia whether you're in the Philippines or Thailand or Vietnam if someone comes across um, whom you've met for the very first time and they come across as being too charming just be careful. Um, I'm not. I mean, there are plenty of charming people who are honest. Right. I mean, you're you're charming. Um, <laughs> but, uh, charm school. I failed charm, charm school. school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was a reject from remedial charm school myself. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah. I found a common theme amongst the people that get scammed yes. in financial dealings. The one thing that I see that runs that always seems to run consistently is greed. Yes. You know, they, you, you can look at investment A, <clears throat> and it's paying a, a, a boring 4%. Yes. You know, but it, it's been doing that for the last 20 years. Yes, yes. And then here comes along Mr. Charming, yes. and he's getting 15%. Yes. And I, yes. Awesome, I often wonder if they should be referred to as victims <laughs> because yes. they're they're trying to jump in on an easy buck yep they want you know if it's too good to be true yes. and all these things that people should know these mm. are 
These are stupid people. Yeah. I mean, they've got a lot hundreds of, them are very bright. of thousands, if not millions of dollars, yep. Yep. and they're chucking it at these things. Yes. And uh, I don't know. I just think that that's the common denominator was the word I'm looking for. Yes. Is people are greedy. A lot of people and, are very greedy. Uh, I don't trips know. Trips them up. Trips them up. And they're willfully gullible. Sometimes yeah. they think, gee, this looks too, too good to be true. But yeah, sometimes they think, gee, this is too good to be true, but my friends invested in it. And I looked at... Um, I looked at an article in this prestigious newspaper or this prestigious magazine and they were singing this guy's praises and you know whether it's gave it know, validity yeah whether it's bernie madoff or whether it's elizabeth holmes um everyone else is singing their praises yeah i'd be a mug to miss out right yeah yeah well um it's also people hear what they want to hear they do and i've i've been guilty of that a thousand times if someone pays you a false compliment yes. or whatever, yes. um, you tend to believe it because you want to you want hear to. that. Mm. And we take it down to a real low level. There's been a million videos about uh, females scamming males, yep. online dating yep. and all that hoo-ha. And again, I, I have to put some of it back on the guy yep. uh, because he's he should know better that he's not good looking <laughs> he's not no. this he's not that mm. yeah but she's telling him that he yeah. is and he's hearing what he wants to hear yes and it's satisfying him there's yes. a there's an emptiness there's a hole there's a desire and he's vulnerable yes. uh, granted mm. but it's it's again he's greedy for the attention he's yes. greedy and I, there's i don't know of a cure for it but i i just think that it's it's fascinating how human nature, uh, you know, it's fool me once, shame on me, yes. fool me twice. Uh, uh, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, yeah. shame on me. You sound like yeah. uh, one President Bush there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot in common. <laughs> so what's your ramifications or what, what are your solutions or what warnings would you give to people that are that are looking to invest in something and they're worried about it or they're going to meet somebody or or they get a, a phone call i mean what's your what you, what would you tell these people that are watching this well i suppose every situation can be different but uh one of the things i would say that is that let's say as far as investing in thailand for example there's a concept called sovereign risk and you can invest in some foreign countries where they might have an unstable government or they might have a, uh, a reputation of investors getting scammed and there are all sorts of real estate scams, property scams in uh, Thailand. So you know, rule 101 of uh, living or investing in Thailand is you just rent. You know, you just rent an apartment or you rent a house. If you buy it, what can happen is that documents can be forged for you know, a couple of dollars, documents uh -huh. can be forged and they can be sold out from underneath you. I mean, there's a very famous, uh, or there are a number of very famous situations in the uh, on the island of Phuket in Thailand, where someone might be married, uh, but the Thai wife uh, has got friend, has got uh, family members, parents typically, who are looking for a handout all the time. And what the wife does is uh, she gets some documents forged. Uh, transfers the property into her name and then she um, borrows against um, the title to the property uh, with some loan sharks and of course you know the interest might be running at 20 percent a year or 20 percent a month or something ridiculous and in no time at all they come in and uh, foreclose on the property and seize it and it's all been done completely fraudulently but the the, the Phuket courts will side with the uh, with the local ties, with the uh, with the loan sharks, and with the wife, and uh, people lose millions of dollars through things like this on a very regular basis in Thailand. So, rule 101 is, uh, as far as investing in real estate in a place like Thailand, is don't do it. Just rent. Don't do it. If you're going to live there, just rent. I mean, I can't talk about the Philippines. I don't know what it's, the situation is here, mm -hmm. but I would certainly not invest in. Um, in real estate in uh, in Thailand, but that was one example. Um, apart, I mean, as far as love scams are concerned, I suppose 
love scams happen all over the place. I mean, yeah, the, it's, it's, it, it goes both ways too. Yes, yep. Women get scammed by men. They do. Uh, you know, that just goes on and on. Mm. And that's kind of one of those horses that's been beat for so long yep. that I'm tired of talking about it. Yep. You know, yep. it's, it, there's yep. other channels that are doing it right mm. this minute. So I've done it before. There's no point in addressing it again. But my point that I wanted to drive home is that there's greed and then there's the ego of, of hearing what you want to hear yes. and therefore believing it even though maybe your gut is telling yeah. you this or yeah. your brain is being overridden by your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I think self-realization is very yeah. important. If you, if you feel like someone is, we got a crowd of kids over there talking, how sweet. Yeah. I hope you can hear us. Yes. Uh, anyway, that's how it goes here when we're on the channel, outside, <laughs> trying to but get it's a off nice the couch. <laughs> What's the name of this place? It's called the Henry. The Henry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I like it because normally it's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a wonderful place. It's the water's just over there. It's, it's fantastic. It, yeah, but um, we were also. You mentioned your father the other oh, day, yeah. and um, this problem with artificial intelligence and um, people making phone calls. Do you want to tell the, your viewers about what happened to your dad? Yeah, it was a memory that I'd actually kind of spaced out. I hope you can hear us over all the, the, knuck, the knucklehead noise over there. We got lucky, didn't we? Yeah, they're very happy. Phil hey. Filipinos are very happy people. And so they're laughing away. They're not laughing at us, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, before I moved over here, um, I went on one last fishing trip up to Canada with my father. And he was cracked. He was devastated. He had received a, my father's elder. He's now 99, 98. Mm. Mm. And at the time he was 91 or 92. Yes. And I, it was our last hurrah to go fishing together before I moved over here. And he received a phone call from someone who sounded like and had information about one of his best friends, yes. a man named Harley. Mm. And he picked up the phone, and my father's also 80% deaf. Yes. So, you know, that played into it. Yes. But these people knew enough about my dad and his personal life and his friend Harley that they said, and my father's name is Dick, they said, hey, mm. Dick, this is Harley. Yes. And it wasn't Harley, but they said, this is Harley. And he said, hey, Harley, how are you doing? He says, well, I'm not doing good. Why? What's the problem? He said, well, I'm in jail. And my dad, you know, he, that didn't sound like Harley. Mm. He, Harley was a pretty straight arrow yes. guy. Yep. Harley liked to have a nip now and then, yes. but that was about the extent mm. of it. So this guy pretending to be Harley said, yeah, I'm in jail. He says, you know what? I was out doing whatever. Uh, I got picked up by the police for drunk driving. And I don't want, I forget her name, we'll call her Evelyn his wife to find mm. out mm. if I do, if she does, I'm in deep, deep, deep stuff. And I, I, they got my wallet, they've got my credit card. Uh, this lawyer is here to help me and he needs a $30,000 retainer. If you could just send that to me, you know I'm good for it. And Harley was a multimillionaire, so my father wasn't worried about the money. And he said, yeah, I'll help you, Harley. Mm. And long story short, he went down to the bank, transferred the money, and boom, the money was gone. Yep. Um, when we got wind of it, my, my sister, myself, uh, as, as the kids, I wasn't there. My sister was. She got involved. She tried to help him. His assistants tried to help him. His housekeepers tried to help him. His neighbors tried to help him. And bottom line was the FBI, the bank, and everybody else told my dad, if you're not in the millions of dollars, we don't even pay attention mm. to it. Mm. So these 30000 that was all of his working capital that yep. he had at the time. Yep. And it pretty much cleaned him out um, of his working capital. Because believe it or not, at the age of 92, he was still active as a real estate broker. Yes, yes. And still making a deal once or twice a year. So that was a scam. Yes. And... Uh, they prey on the elderly, and this was before all this AI stuff. Yes. But it it's a little creepy, not yes. a little creepy, it's really creepy, that they can mimic my voice or your voice right now mm. and call you 
and run the same game on you or me or anybody watching. And it's almost like you don't know who to trust. Yes. They can spit out a script for a YouTube channel. Yes. I guess I could download this AI thing and say, give me a 500 word script on yeah. whatever, and it would be perfectly executed. Yes. I could never do that because yeah. it would take away from what I do, which is mm. screw everything up. <laughs> <laughs> mm. It came out perfect. They'd know there was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your take on all that? Well, yeah, one of the things that I've noticed is that there are people uh, putting out warnings now that there are criminals who will, say, tape a child's voice or tape a young person's voice. They'll use AI so they can impersonate AI being artificial intelligence and then they will phone the parents uh, and they will have this uh, voice saying, look, I've been kidnapped, you need to pay this ransom money and it's always urgent, of course, so there's no chance for the parents to check what's going on. And this is one of the things, whenever it's difficult to verify anything, uh, yeah, that can be a drama. But there are people who will uh, pretend that they've kidnapped someone, use artificial intelligence, uh, use the voice of the child, uh, and then extort money like that. So it's just one more thing to be, to be careful of. So, Have yeah, you got any gonna... kind of answers for that? I mean, is there, is there... I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. If I got a phone call and I thought it was my kid, yeah. um, and they've got the, the voice down nailed, yeah. I don't know. Well, I suppose if you're just aware that this sort of thing goes on, um, maybe, I mean, I, I don't have an answer for anything. Right. But for, no, well, well, maybe they I do. I don't have an answer for everything. Well, yes, if you've got answers, you can put some comments below and uh, give us your pearls of wisdom, because we're not the fount of wisdom, are we, Paul? Not at all. No. But I mean, all we can do Quite is the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> but all we can do is sort of show you some red flags. Yeah. But I tell you what, you, uh, we mentioned one of the presidents, um, George W. Bush, a moment ago, and uh, there was another U.S. president by the name of Jimmy Carter, and for a while he was a governor of one of the American states. And uh, that very charming con man from Wales, uh, whom I met over 20 years ago, I uh, actually went round to his house and I was in the study. And there was this beautiful picture on his study wall and it was of him standing with Jimmy Carter and there were a couple of other people in the room but it was one of the things to give the con man credibility and quite often you will see that con men do make sure that they get themselves photographed with uh, you know people of importance people of significance whether it's a movie star whether it's a senior politician right. whether it's a senior business person sure they'll do that get themselves photographed and then um, they'll use that almost as a sales pitch, it's just to add to their credibility. So it's just another little thing to be aware of. And don't get fooled by, uh, you know, appearances. No, because those guys take a hundred pictures at an event with yep. anybody. With anybody. You're just standing yep. there with Jimmy Carter or yep. Ronald Reagan or yep. President Obama or yep. who, you name it. Yep. You know, Warren Buffett, all these yep. people we're talking about, Elon Musk, you happen yep. to run into him and yep. you're standing there with him and you've got all these pictures on yep. your credenza yep. behind you, that's just a subtle little con in and of yes. itself yes. as you're sitting across the yes. desk from this yes. guy, yes. and he doesn't even have to mention them. <laughs> no. just, you're, you're just looking oh, wow. at him. You say, well, this guy's in with, the, well, with he, the big boys. He's connected. Yeah. Look at all the connections he's got. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be in this guy's presence. Yeah. How, yeah. how can I doubt him? Why should I, yeah. why should I check yeah. on anything? I should just take his word for everything. So what kind of work are you doing? I know that with, for the longest time you've been involved with the Death Island. Yes. Can you go into that a little bit? Okay, well, there is this island in uh, the Gulf of Thailand. It's called Koh Tao, and uh, it's only about, oh, I suppose, eight square kilometers large, it's, so it's very tiny. But there have been dozens of uh, murders uh, and or suspicious deaths on this island in the last 20 odd years and uh, quite often the mainstream media when they publish stories about that they might only refer to a half or a third of these deaths. It did get the tag uh, Death Island some years ago. Uh, a lot of people on um, social media were referring to it as Death Island and then uh, a lady by the name of Sue Buchanan who ran the Samui Times online news service she made a mention that the locals were referring to it as Death Island and then 
the uh, British tabloids and other newspapers picked it up and then once it was referred to as Death Island, that name stuck. So uh, one of the things which I did in recent years is I created a YouTube channel of my own which is called Koh Tao Murders Death Island uh, just so that you know, algorithms will pick things up uh, in, in search engine optimization and I've got over a hundred videos about various murders and uh, rapes and uh, violent crimes that have occurred uh, on that island because the mainstream media in Thailand is very much shackled because there are very serious criminal defamation laws and the Computer Crimes Act uh, which prohibit or which really prevent uh, people from shining a light on a lot of the crime on the place and they don't want to ruin the tourist industry. Don't want to, yeah, so it's all about saving face, it's all about protecting the tourism industry. So a lot of things are swept under the carpet. And while things are kept silent and swept, un swept under the carpet, of course, the body count just keeps rising. And uh, anyway, so I, I was aware that a lot of now, people... are these people, are these foreigners that are getting murdered? Are these locals? What's going on? Well, there are... All I ever heard about was some couple on the beach. Yeah, 2014. That's what yeah. I, that's the only thing I really know yeah. about. Yeah, okay, that was... Uh, that came across my radar. That was David Miller and uh, Hannah Witheridge. They were found um, battered to death on the very southern end of Syri Beach on Koh Tao. And uh, there were sort of all... In, there were appearances that Hannah had also been raped, um, but there were varying reports too. The police were saying she was raped or she wasn't raped, so the story was never kept uh, straight. But uh, David had been uh, battered and he had defence wounds on him, and uh, he was found uh, in the water near Hannah, and he, he'd actually drowned. But he was probably going to die anyway. But anyway, they were brutally murdered, and... Uh, Everyone was uh, pointing the finger at the um, a local uh, family that uh, ran that particular section of the island, but and there were many reports that the in fact the the, the uh, lieutenant general of the uh, police who was first investigating this, his name was Kanya Maman or Maimen M A M E N. He um, uh, was very much pointing the finger at this uh, influential family and. Uh, the son, who was about 24 years of age, he was reported to have fled uh, the area on a, uh, a speedboat early in the morning. I heard that the name of the boat was Lucky, uh, was Little Little Duck. Uh, whether it was or not, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, the the finger was being pointed at him initially, but then the chief of police, a fellow by the name of Somyot, uh, he became uh, chief of police a couple of weeks later, and then. Uh, he uh, wound up sending this Lieutenant General away and all of the focus was turned to the Burmese community and uh, there were two young Burmese guys, they are only about five foot two or five foot three and uh, David was about six foot three so he was a monster compared to them but the, uh, the story that the police wanted to put out was that these two little guys had somehow managed to overpower two much larger English tourists and murder them both, uh, despite the fact that both these guys had no criminal records and for all intents and purposes they were quite gentle creatures. Uh, so the attention turned away from the local family, which was... Uh, that had the power. They had the power and they're referred to as a mafia family on the island. Uh, so they, um, that's where the attention went and uh, a lot of journalists were saying, oh, all of these uh, since uh, the murders of Hannah and David, we've had you know all uh, like a 10, 12, 15 more people murdered on the island, but, and they've said that that was the first one. But in fact, I did a bit of uh, looking into this, and uh, I get a lot of tips from people as well. And a lot of people volunteer information to me, and uh, I have uh, created videos going back to January of 2000. I found that a fellow by the name of Ian Jacobs had been murdered on the island and that was covered up as um, him having had an accident and in fact invariably what the police there do is they say oh no they don't really carry out, carry out the investigation in fact their word for investigation really means when you translate it, it actually means cover up so they'll say oh this person committed suicide or this person um, th this person uh, had an accident or whatever but I found him in 2000 so that was 
14 years before Hannah and David. And then uh, I discovered that a fellow called Mr. Ban, uh, his Thai name was Virat Azavachan, and he owned the very biggest dive uh, diving school on this very famous island. And he was shot six times in cold blood in the head um, as he was sitting having coffee with some friends. And this was basically late in the afternoon, so it's broad daylight. So he was, he was murdered, that was in 2002, and pe people didn't know about that. And then there was a, um, uh, a Japanese uh, scuba instructor who was, had been in a de facto relationship with the fellow who founded Big Blue Diving. And uh, she vanished on the 18th of June 2004, and her body was found seven days later in the jungle. Uh, it was kind of decomposed and there had been some predatory birds that had been feeding on her body. Um, but then I reported <coughs> this on both YouTube and my Facebook page, which is Koh Tao Death Island. But uh, they got, um, I reported that and then the Thai police issued a whole series of press releases to various newspapers within Thailand saying, oh no, um, uh, this uh, YouTuber, being yeah. Ian Yarwood, you know, this lawyer, He's just trying to, he and his uh, uh, followers are simply trying to discredit the, uh, the country. But no, she was found with a suicide note in her, uh, in her house. But in fact... Uh, Can they, you address why these people are needing their early demise? What might have caused it? Is it a, a business deal gone bad? Is it a, a drug deal that went bad? Is it just violence for the sake of violence? I can't understand what the motivation is for them to, to meet that fate. Yes, well, I, I think well, every, every death will be different. And okay. sometimes we can look at some. I mean, there was a, a, a Californian guy. His name was uh, Anthony Cardulo. He came from, um, oh, I forget. It'll come to me later. But he came from California, uh, Newport, Newport Beach yeah, yeah. in California. He was a very successful um, hotel and nightclub promoter. Anyway, he uh, opened up, well, he launched a bar there called the, uh, the Lotus Bar, which is one of the most famous bars on Syrie Beach. And uh, he was making a fortune, and uh, I've interviewed uh, a couple of his friends, and uh, one of the guy, who, guy's name is uh, Paddy Callahan, who is British. He doesn't live on Koh Tao anymore, but he said that he's 80% sure that... Um, Tony was murdered because, I mean, he basically had a business, it was making a fortune, but you always have to have a Thai business partner. Right. And so, um, you know, if, he's, if he dies, you know, the Thai business partner just takes over the business. But, um, easy peasy. Easy peasy. Now, you know, I can't say 100% that the fellow was murdered, but there's a lot of um, things that suggest that he was. And in fact, another f uh, friend of his uh, told me th uh, that he was actually with Tony one day when a member of the local mafia threatened both of them. Mm. And uh, the friend, who's now in Hawaii as far as I know, um, he um, thought, well, discretion is a better part of Vela, I'm out of here. So he left the island. But Smart move. Tony thought, no, I'll stay here because I'm making so much money and I'm having such a great time. So he stayed there and he eventually wound up dead. And um, So do you see any hope for journalism in these situations? Mm. Well, Real I'm, journalism, yeah. I mean? Obviously, it's being, it's being suppressed by the government. Yeah. Um, you're not going to get any cooperation. I imagine witnesses or anybody that may be mm. close to it are afraid to speak. Yes. Um, I know what you speak of with the Burmese folks. Yes. Because I saw them being, when I was there for a short period of time, yes. just about a year, um, in trucks like cattle. Mm. They were just brought in as cheap labor. Yes. You know, the Thais would bring the Burmese in. Yes. And I can't, you know, when you say the two Burmese guys murdered that couple, mm. I, for what? Yeah. You know, and what would they even be there for? Yeah. They're just, it's just not how they operate. Yes. It's just not, they wouldn't even be in that location unless yes. they were building something or digging a yeah. hole. You know, they're just like almost indentured servants. Yes. So, uh, do you have any kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, do you have any kind of a positive kind of spin as to where truth, I mean, I know you're trying to seek out the truth on these things, but do you, do you see any daylight at the end of this? Well, I suppose as far as Thailand itself 
is concerned, it's going to take a long time to change social attitudes. Mm. It's going to take a long time to change the law. Do you uh, think the families will get closure on any of these things that uh, you've aforementioned here? Well, I think some families might get closure, but you know, one of the very disturbing things which happened uh, at the trial of the two young Burmese guys is that uh, a journalist, a British journalist, a veteran journalist by the name of Sarah Ewan was speaking with uh, Ian Miller, who was the father of David Miller, and uh, she was pointing out to him that you know, like, all of this material that's coming out in the trial, it really doesn't s support a guilty verdict against the two Burmese guys. Right. And uh, Ian Miller's response was, according to Sarah Ewan, I wasn't there, but Sarah Ewan said his response was, I just want someone to be guilty, <laughs> which is, I mean, uh, it's mind-blowing. But um, Ian Miller and his wife Sue and their surviving son Michael got out on the steps of the Samui Provincial Court when the uh, convictions were handed down and the death sentence was imposed on these two young guys. And uh, Michael Miller made a very powerful but somewhat, you know, with respect, somewhat foolish speech in which he was praising, he was praising the work of the Royal Thai Police in one of the most sho you know, shoddy, uh, uh, muddled investigations you could ever imagine, which was you know, featured bogus DNA evidence and uh, it was just a, a, a travesty of justice, but he was praising the Royal Thai well, Police. What got you so interested in all this? Well, this has been quite a crusade since I first met it, you. It has been. Well, in fact, uh, what happened was that I'd been assisting uh, a few uh, journalists and human rights activists who were getting into trouble in Thailand for reporting on different uh, crimes, whether it was um, the trafficking of Rohingya boat, boat people. So I was helping out an Australian journalist by the name of um, Alan Morrison and I sat through a three-day trial on the island of Phuket where he was and I'd written to every uh, federal politician in Australia about the case and made a big song and dance in support of him and I'd been uh, very supportive of a British human rights activist by the name of Andy Hall and uh, I'd turned up in a, uh, a couple of courts with him uh, and helped him out financially for quite a while and Andy Hall initially got involved with trying to help the Burmese guys and Andy asked me to put him in touch with a DNA expert in Australia so I put him in touch with a lady by the name of Jane Torpen who is a forensic scientist in Melbourne and she actually flew to Thailand uh, to assist with the trial but unfortunately the defence lawyers decided not to call her to give evidence and it was which was you could either see that as being a terrible mistake where you could see it as possibly being a situation where maybe the defence lawyers themselves were being threatened not to do too good a job. So those two guys, are they still in prison? They're still in Bangkwang Central Prison. That's now, it. Now there was one saving grace, which is in 2020, the new king whose um, name is Maha Vajralongkorn, he's King Rama X, uh, he um, granted a blanket um, amnesty for everyone who was on um, death row, so they were all the sentences were commuted to uh, life in prison. So now they're they're facing life sentences, but they've been in prison for what eight and a half years now, and um, so yeah, it's coming up to nine years, I suppose. So they're still in prison in, and they're in very crowded conditions. They're not coping very no, well. No, no, can't be. And you know the the, the, the prison cells are terrible. You know they they sleep head to toe, side by side. And uh, with COVID, they've only been let out of their cells, you know, very little. And uh, they've had very few visitors. I mean, these guys often go seven months at a time without having a visit from family members. So they're really doing it tough. And their names are Zorlin and YPO. And they're mentioned very heavily on my YouTube channel, which... All right, so I'm going to put a link to your YouTube yep. channel. Uh, we're going to wind it up. Yes. We've been going wrong, which is fine. Yes. Um, I wanted to make sure you had ample time to talk. Yes. What are people going to see if they click on your YouTube channel? What kind of information will they receive if they're interested in finding out yep. more about this? 
Yeah, okay, well there are over 100 videos on the channel. Some of them are only a few minutes long. Some of them uh, will be 10 or 15 or 20 minutes long. Uh, I've got some interviews with people who survived unprovoked attacks on the island. Um, I mean, some of those are, say, Carla Bartel, uh, Sam Benning, and um, a, a Dutch fellow by the name of George. I've got interviews with them. So they run for a fair while, but you know, I've, I've even got very short videos of a couple of minutes that just really are a list of 24 people who've died on the island. So there's a variety. And name the island again? It's Ko Tao, which is K-O-H, which is one word, Tao, T-A-O. And Ko is the Thai word for island, and Tao is the word for turtle. So and what's the attraction to go there? The biggest attraction is it's one of the best diving destinations in the world. And I can tell you, I've, I've been there. Uh, some of my detractors, there are a lot of um, uh, people who follow the channel who are very derogatory. I've, what, what do you call people who? What do what do you call people who um, follow channels and they write lots of bad stuff? What you, uh, um, old dog people. No, no, not old dog people. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are trolls. Lot, trolls. Yes, there are there are a lot of uh, trolls who follow the channel and, and they write lots of derogatory things and they try to um, attack yes, my credibility. Do. I've been told that I've uh, never been to Asia. In fact, I was born in Indonesia. I've been told I've never been to Thailand. I've been there dozens of times. In fact, I even speak a little bit of Thai and can read a little bit of Thai and a few of the hill tribe languages. And uh, yes, I have been to Koh Tao. And I thought, you know, just, you know, for the sake of clarity, Koh Tao, the, it's got a lot of natural beauty. Uh, the diving is fantastic. I actually just did snorkeling. So would you would you tell somebody don't go there? Don't go there. There are better places. That's, that's to go. really what you would say. Yeah, I would say don't go to Koh Tao. Okay. In fact, there was one very witty person. I remember. Um, in fact, I've got a uh, uh, a meme on my uh, on my channel where people were asked, "Is Koh Tao safe?" And one very witty person says, "Oh yes, it's, I agree with everyone else who's saying it's perfectly safe." just so long as you go there in the daytime and that way you won't uh, be accused of murder, get murdered or be thrown into prison uh, with a death sentence. So that was one very sort of witty tongue-in-cheek comment. And so you plan on sticking with this. You're going to keep oh, following well. through and yeah. fighting the good fight. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> people have kept dying and so, you know, what, what's happened is that, you know, I, I keep making videos about the people who keep dying and also I keep getting new information Sure. Uh, f about people who died in the past. So I just published that and uh, I mean, I've got no power of my own other than to shine a light on things. But Fair I've got enough. very limited power of my own. Well, I appreciate everything that you do. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you were on the channel. Uh, hopefully it was informative mm. and maybe, I don't know, how would you end it up? What would you, what would be your parting words for the folks that Well, watch? I would thank everyone for viewing and uh, for all the American viewers, and I think something like two-thirds of uh, Old Dog's viewers are in the United States, so yeah. I, I think you've got bragging rights because there have been a couple of documentaries made about Koh Tao, and uh, these are documentaries made by English uh, film production companies, but their research has been quite superficial at times, whereas the American research has actually been really good. I'm not saying all American investigative journalists are fantastic, no. but the ones who have done the, the podcast, uh, Death Island, they've done a great job. And uh, uh, episode nine has only just come out. And episode nine is um, what features Sarah Ewan talking about her conversation with, with Ian Miller at uh, the Samui Provincial Court. So, are there any resources that, you're avail that you know that are available to people that, that they could probably watch that would prevent them from possibly being scammed or taken advantage of in the future? Is there any book or show or anything that you can recommend that people watch? Oh, no. No? Okay. <laughs> it is, it's, no, I okay. think... Because you like just, I said, we mentioned 60 minutes earlier yes. on. Sometimes they run stuff mm. like that. So I didn't know if there was somebody that you considered to be an expert that could no. you know, help you spot a scammer or spot a scam. Yeah. But I guess it's just... Um, throw caution to the wind and you get that phone call from a stranger, mm. someone that you don't really know, mm. um, think twice before yeah. you throw your money at it yeah. or your time or your emotions, yeah. right? And yeah, but I mean, and um, yeah, just do your research on everything. I mean, uh, yeah, don't, 
don't necessarily believe everything you read or see. I mean, if you see a, a, a very glossy advertisement for some fantastic foreign hol holiday destination, I mean, the people promoting it, whether it's a, um, uh, someone who's got a business on the island or whether it's a travel agent, they don't care if you get murdered. They don't care if you get raped or robbed. You know, right. they're, they're just salespeople who are, they've got something to sell. And uh, so, be, and, and it's the same with investments. You know, don't believe everything you see or hear. It sounds too good to be true, it probably Probably is. is yeah. All right, kids. Okay. Thanks for tuning in. Ian, thank, thank you. you very much for being on the channel. Thank you, and, viewers. Uh, we will see you crazy people next time. Okay, cheers. Bye for now.